Testament survey, and we are going to go through the uh, section in Genesis chapter 22, and we're we're dealing with uh, explaining the uh, the entire overview of the Bible. <coughs> Excuse me, Old Testament survey. We're surveying the entire book, and so what we are doing is we're going through and we're seeing how God, in His book. Uh, it gives us a history of redemption, and so we're calling this the uh, unfolding drama of redemption, which is a book a, a, to teach the Old Testament survey that uh, we're using the notes from. And now this section of the, the scriptures that we're in is the life of Abraham. And this is now the, uh, we have the prologue up until the time of Babel. And then after the Tower of Babel, we have this uh, God working through a particular family. And that family is Abraham's family. And it becomes the Jewish, uh, the Jewish um, tribe and eventually a nation. And so now here we have Abraham in Genesis 22. And this is now, his faith has been tested. And now his faith is going to be perfected. It took 25 years uh, of uh, since uh, Isaac's uh, birth, he's now 25 years old, and Abraham has had one son of promise. He's had one son, Ishmael, who's not of promise, and we talked about that last week. But now he is dealing with Ishmael, and Ishmael is 25 years old, and now he's going to have his faith perfected by the Lord. So let's look at Genesis 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things, God did tempt Abraham. And said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon, uh, upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. <clears throat> and Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went up unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now here we begin this journey to Mount Moriah. God has told him uh, what to do, and he's told him where to go, but he has not told him uh, exactly what's going to happen or why it's going to happen. But Abraham is acting in faith, and we, we brought this up last week. We introduced the topic, uh, but now we want to see the obedience of Abraham as he as he begins his absolute obedience unto God. Notice that uh, Abraham rose up early in the morning the next day. Abraham goes immediately to this journey, and we see that it is three days into the wilderness. As we mentioned last week, that is a picture. He's, it's being set up as a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was in the tomb for three days. Now, in the Bible, we don't, um, you know, if you go down the internet, you'll see things like there's Bible codes and there's uh, letters in the text. And if you count every, you know, 26 letters, it's going to have a, you know, prophecy. God's not working like that. Uh, it's, that's not how God at, operates. He operates in the, in the pictures that are here. But numbers are important. And three to, uh, is an important number. And God has said that here there is a um, uh, three days Christ was in the tomb. And three days was Jonah in the belly of the whale. And three days was um, uh, Isaac here on his way to this to be sacrificed. Three days they marched around. I mean, the three days they, they had to wait before they went through the river Jordan with Joshua. And so there are, uh, three is an important number. Seven is an important number. Uh, God has created the world in seven days. And so that's an important number for God. Uh, there are, the 12 is an important number because it represents some things of their 12 tribes of Israel and their 12 um, uh, disciples that he had and the 12 foundations in the, in the, um, in the, in the, uh, the city of New Jerusalem. There's, there are uh, importance in the numbers, but not like you're going to find where if you go through and count codes, you're going to come up with secret information that nobody could find before. That's not the meaning. The meaning is that this has to do with death. It has to do with the end of self. It has to do with uh, cessation and regeneration. It has to do with death, burial, and resurrection. And so when Joshua st was out there for three days, they had to prepare to go through the Jordan. And they had already been through the Red Sea, and then they went through the River Jordan on dry ground. God stopped up the river. And they were coming in as one people and going, you know, they were, they were uh, on one side of the river, and they went into the promises of God having been uh, dying to self. Uh, and you see uh, uh, Jonah there in the belly of the whale, and he came out ready to preach the gospel. And then you have Jesus dying and rising again for our sins. And so here's a picture of 
the Lord Jesus. And in that picture, uh, you're going to see God, uh, Abraham. Notice what he says here, um, verse uh, 5. Look here, uh, verse, chapter 22. Verse 5 says, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide you here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. Notice that he didn't say, I'm going to come again to you, uh, but uh, he said, me and the lad. Now his, his son, 25-year-old Isaac, are going to go up the mountain, and we are going to be coming back. He's acting in faith. These, this is the secret of his victory. He acted in faith. Abraham believed God. He trusted in God. It was his obedience. The faith that he had was the root of his obedience. And the obedience that he had was the fruit of his faith. He trusted in God. That's a great testimony to us, that Abraham trusted in God. He was dependent upon God. It's the secret of his victory. And then what we find is this, this um, passage goes on, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in hand and the knife, and they, they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? You know, he's just on asking an honest question. You know, they're going up the hill, they're going to make an offering. He said, We got the fire, we got the wood, we don't have an offering. Father, what are we going to do? And he doesn't have any idea what's going on. They're on their way up the mountain, and Abraham has had a dead son for three days. Because he's known what he's going to have to do when he gets to the top of that mountain. He's got the knife strapped to his, his uh, side, probably. He's got that ready, and he had to sharpen it that morning before he left on the first day. And he thought, I'm going to have to plunge this into my son. But he trusted in God, because he knew that God told him, that son is going to be the one that you're going to have a multitude of children. You're going to have a multitude of descendants. So he didn't understand how it was all going to work out, but he just trusted in God. He didn't know if God was going to bring him back from the dead, if God was going to work a miracle. He just said, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. God will not tell you to sacrifice your son, just so you know that. If you hear a voice from God that says, kill somebody, that's not of God. This is a one-time event in history, and God used this as a picture. You will not hear a voice from God to kill anyone. Uh, that says, if you, hear the, if you see a, a, an image in the night and it says, go and uh, do something to somebody, take their life, and uh, that is not God. That is, not, that is a, a demonic spirit and you should ignore that. You should turn to, from it and ask the Lord to deliver you from whatever is oppressing you because this is never going to happen again. And I should point that out because some people would take that and say, well, I saw a vision and it told me I should go kill my neighbor's son. Well, that's not God. Okay, this is a picture that God has used in the life of Abraham, and he never repeated this again, because this is a special event. Abraham's chosen and only promised son. God has not set up anybody else to be a picture of Christ. Revelation has ceased. God is not demonstrating to us uh, these pictures anymore. They're all written in the Bible. We can expect it all to come from the Word of God. So we're not going to have that revelation again, and I should point that out, lest anybody ever come to you or, or, or try to uh, add that to your, uh, your experience, then you can recognize that that is not of God. Okay, now, the witness of the Lord. Let's move on. We're going to have Abraham up there. He's asked the question, where's the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. So now he's got Isaac, and he's got him uh, right on the altar, and he's got him bound, and he's got him laid out on the wood, and he's going to sacrifice him and then burn him, just as God has told him to do. What an amazing... Um, situation he's in. Verse 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham! And he said, Here am I. And I'm sure that he had a great sense of relief at this very moment. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and looked, and behold, him a ram caught in the thicket by, the, by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram, and offered up his, the, for a burnt offering instead of his son. 
Now I want you to see that this is a picture of Jesus. In one sense, Isaac was being a picture of Jesus because he's being offered. But in another sense, this is a picture of you too. Because as a sinner, you don't want to be that one laying on the altar, suffering death. You see, Jesus died as an offering for sin. Isaac here is now going to be a dual picture because now Isaac has been spared. He said, don't lay your hand upon the, son, upon the lad. And see, that's you. Don't lay your hand upon the lad. You're, you're, you're sentenced to die. But God, in his mercy, has provided a, lamb, a ram in the thicket for you. And just as God's hand of wrath has lifted up to strike you, God has provided a substitute to strike instead. And that's Jesus Christ. That is why we can go to heaven. That is why we can have our sins forgiven. Because God provided a ram in the thicket in Jesus Christ. The hand of God was lifted to strike the blow of death because of our sin and we deserved it. And yet, God said, wait, stop, don't. Don't kill this person. Wait, I provided a ram in the thicket. My son, I'll strike him. And you know that love that Abraham had for his son? God had for his son. You know that hope that Abraham had in his son being his inheritor and, and bringing forth a multitude? God had in his son. And he had all that love in his heart for his son. And yet he would strike his son for you. You see Abraham, the love of his, the father, and you see the, the obedience of the son, Jesus going to the cross for you, and him dying in your place. What a picture is here told, and the picture is then turned and wrapped into salvation, so you can also see that there is a ram in the thicket for you. You just have to make sure that you put your faith like Abraham did in God. Otherwise, the ram in the thicket will do you no good, and the hand of God will strike you instead. Unless you put your faith in the ram in the thicket, you're going to be left on the altar. You see Abraham's obedience? He said uh, he did what God had told him to do. He was ready. And, a, and God said, wait, stop. There's a picture here that I also want to show. Not only do I want to show the love of the Father sacrificing his son upon an altar like Jesus was done for us, I also want to show a picture of a substitute so that your heart doesn't have to be broken over the loss of your son. And God's heart doesn't have to be broken over the loss of his children. Because he loves you. He cares about you. And He doesn't want to see you die. He doesn't want to see you end eternally separated from Him. He wants to see you saved, delivered. You know they went home, they walked home off that mountain rejoicing. They were probably singing a song. They might have wrote a song on the way down here. That was pretty common back then. They didn't have the Bibles. They didn't have any, uh, they, they didn't have what, what we have as a completed Word of God, all the songs they could have sung. But, you know, Moses wrote a song when he was delivered and they wrote a song and Deborah sang after they they went across the, uh, the Red Sea. They, had, they wrote a song, and the whole congregation sang it. And I suppose that maybe on the way down from that mountain, Abraham and, and his son Isaac were singing a song together. And they were praising God. And, and they were recognizing <coughs> that the picture that God had given of a coming Messiah had been fulfilled in their lives. They got to not only... They had made sacrifices before. They had made offerings upon altars before. And I'm sure that Abraham explained to Isaac the meaning, because when Abraham went up, uh, when Isaac went up, he recognized immediately they were missing something for the sacrifice. He knew how it all worked. He knew there was supposed to be an offering made, and that no, they, they didn't have an animal, and he knew what kind. But you know, when they were going down that mountain, I'm sure that Isaac was recognizing the plan of salvation. He was, he, he had felt what it was like to have a substitute die for him. He felt what it was like to not be sacrificed, not be condemned, not have to die. You know, a sacrifice is, is, is put to death on account of sin. Sacrifices aren't just made because somebody wants to see some blood and kill an animal and, and, and have some fun. Sacrifices are made because they're horrible, they're bloody, they're ugly, and it's a picture that this is not going to happen to me. It's going to happen to the animal as a picture of what should happen to me. That's what, that's what those sacrifices were. And of course, that was actually a picture of what was going to happen in Christ. He shed his blood. And so we recognize that the animal was a picture of the coming Messiah. So when those people in the Old Testament who hadn't had a Bible to read about Jesus, they didn't have a picture of the, of the cross in their mind and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, they could then look backwards 
and I mean to look forwards in the sacrifices and say, this is how I'm going to be saved. I'm not going to work my way to heaven. I'm not going to find eternal life because I've been a good person. I deserve to be that animal, that sacrifice, but that is in my place. Picturing the Messiah to come. So thank God for the substitute. So the witness of God, he says, because you've lifted up your, uh, because you have not spared for me, verse 12, and he said, Lay not the hand of the Son, neither do thou anything uh, unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast withheld, not withheld thy Son, thine only Son, from me. You know, Abraham had complete faith, and that's what you need to have too. You know, a lot of people don't have the kind of faith that they're supposed to have in, in God. They don't want to have the faith that would even give up their only Son. What is your only treasure? What is your last reservation? Well, I can't trust God that much. You either trust God with all your heart or you don't trust Him at all. You can't trust Him partially. Trust Him in the sense that you recognize that you would give whatever you have into His care and you can trust Him to take care of you. How can you trust Him to care for your eternal soul if you can't trust Him to take care of your own children? Or your own family? Or your own life? Or your own possessions? Or your, your own future? Your eternal soul is far more valuable. How can you say, I trust in him to be the dying savior for my sins, if you aren't doing what Abraham did and saying, well, I give up everything to God. I give up everything to God. I'm not going to hold back on God. What's he going to do? Take it from you and then mess you all up because you gave it to him? Ha, I'll teach you to trust me. That's not what happened. You see, Abraham trusted in God, even his only son. And what did God do? He delivered him. He delivered him. See, what we think is if we trust in God, and if I put all my trust in Him, and especially if I give up my children to God, and by that I mean just in your heart, um, He's going to do something to them. Oh, if I give up my finances to God, He's going to mess me up. If I give up my life to God, He's going to make me do something I don't want to do. That's really not the God we serve. That's not the God of the Bible. He doesn't then turn it on you and say, oh, I'll teach you, teach you a good lesson, don't ever trust me again. What would you do? If somebody said, all right, for the first time in my life, I'm going to trust you, would you instantly poke him in the eye? Ha, huh, that'll teach you. Is that what you would do? No, God is going to protect you like a child. He's going to care for you. And if you go through something you didn't expect, it won't be for your bad. It'll be for your good. Trust him. So now we get into Genesis 23. And in Genesis 23, uh, we find that he goes to uh, Mech Mechpelah. I don't even know if I said that right. <clears throat> but look in chapter 23, verse 1. And Sarah was 100, and let's see, it was 107 and, and 20 years old. She's 127 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kerjath uh, uh, Arabah, the same as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And so here in this place, he finds himself the only piece of property that Abraham ever bought. It was a grave. Abraham, the inheritor of the entire area of Canaan. Abraham, the, the man who's going to be the father of a multitude. Abraham, the man who is going to um, be the father of a great nation and a blessing to all men, only owns a grave. And this is it, the grave of his wife. It's a sad time for Abraham. He finally got his son, and then he loses his precious wife. And she has now passed away. Uh, Abraham then is um, without uh, his most precious treasure, his wife. He loved her very much. Look here in chapter 24, and we find that uh, Rebecca comes on the scene. And Abraham was old, verse 1, ch chapter 24, and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under thy thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, uh, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take unto take a wife unto my son of the daughters of Canaan, among whom I dwell. You know, Abraham is now going to require his servant, Eliezer, to go and find a wife for him of, the godly, of a godly uh, character. He doesn't want him, his son to find a wife from the Canaanites, because the Canaanites were ungodly. And to have a mixed 
a home like that would have been the destruction of the seed that Abraham had been given and trusted with. And so a home should be a godly home. And he recognized that. Abraham had a godly wife, and he had a godly home. And Hagar turned out to be a, um, a thorn in their house, and so they both were kicked out. Her, her and her son, Ishmael, was a, 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 a bad uh, influence upon the home. They had to go. But Abraham wanted a godly home, and he taught that to his son, and he's teaching it to his son now as he sends Eliezer out for a, uh, for a wife. And so what happens here, um, we find that uh, Eliezer goes. And this is a wonderful little story. Uh, you, should, uh, you, should, you should read this story in Genesis chapter 24. But what happens with, uh, El with Eliezer is he goes to, um, uh, to, the, to the land where um, Haran, where, his son, where, his, uh, uh, where Abraham was from. And if we look in verse 10, And the servants took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed, for all the goods of his master were in the hand. And he arose and went to uh, Mesopotamia, under the city of Nahor. Nahor was the man that was related to Abraham. And he made his camels to kneel down without, without the city by a well of water. In the time of evening, in the, in the time that uh, the women go out to draw water, in verse 12, and he said, now notice here, this is Eliezer, man of God. He says, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me God's, a good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass, that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she, and she shall say, Drink, and I will give thee camels to drink also. Let the same be that which thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby I shall know that thou hast shown kindness unto my master. He says, you know, I'm going to say a prayer, Lord, here, and I want you to send the, the woman that's for my son, my master's son. Send her out to do this particular thing. I want you to send someone who says, not only will I give you to drink, but I'll give you a drink for your camels. That's a lot of water. He had ten camels, it says here, and um, they drink a lot of water. Camels have humps filled with water. They can drink gallons of water. They're thirsty. They've crossed the desert. And it's a long way from where they were. I believe it was over 400 miles they've traveled now. And here they are, thirsty. And he says, send me a woman that wants to work hard. Send me a woman with character who has compassion on the thirsty. Not only on the people, on the animals too. Send me somebody who's not a slacker. Send me somebody who works hard and is willing to, to go the extra mile to be compassionate and have hospitality. Send me somebody with godly character so that I can know that this is of God. And sure enough, if uh, there wasn't a lady, verse 15, it came to pass, before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Micah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, and w with her, and pitched and, and pitch her upon her shoulders. And the damsel was, in, was uh, very fair to look upon, a virgin neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up again. And the servants ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, a little drink of water thy pitcher, water thy pitcher. And she said, verse 18, Drink, my, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when he had done giving drink and said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran into the well and and to draw water, and drew for all the camels. And the man was wondering at her, at her, and the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. All of a sudden, here comes this lady. She's beautiful. She's young. She's unmarried. She's got godly character. She's mature. She's a hard worker. And she comes out, and she happens to be from the household that Eliezer's been sent to go find a wife. And she, he, God answers his prayers right there on the spot. And therefore, he says, God, have you made my way prosperous already? I haven't even finished my prayer. And thank God for the prayers that he answers while they're still in your mouth. Oh, that God would answer some of these prayers that are still in your mouth. And sometimes we just need to make those prayers. And God will answer them. Honest prayers, diligent prayers, seeking. you got children, you got daughters. Pray that God will send you the right ones. Uh, that, God, that would be godly men looking for a wife. Not looking for a playmate, looking for a wife. You got sons? 
pray that God would uh, provide for you direction when it comes time to be married. That God would give you direction. That you would deliver your sons from having to... You know, he didn't send Isaac out there to do this. He didn't say, now go out there, date around, check out the pretty girls. When you find one you like, then bring her home. He said, uh, he, said he, he trusted Eliezer to find somebody for her. Now, we're not going to go out and find a, a wife for our children just in the same way. This was a, a, um, a, 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 a time <coughs> when they had a, a cultural situation here with Eliezer. But... Why can't we pray? Why can't we as fathers pray for our sons? Why can't we as mothers pray for our sons? Why can't we pray for our daughters and say, God, bring the per person. Bring them in, in, with character. Bring them with purity. Bring them with holiness. Bring them with a life that is honoring to you so that we can perpetuate a godly seed and have a godly house and have godly offspring and their homes be godly too. Why must we send our children out and let them all play around? and hope that one of the, one, kind of like throwing a bunch of stuff against the wall and seeing which one sticks. That's how we send, that's what we do to our children. Instead of like Eliezer praying, oh God, let, let the right one come, and then having some confidence because God has answered some specific prayers. Why don't we pray, and why don't we say, God, show us who our children would, would, would have, who would be right for our kids. Show us how, give us a confidence they'd be right for our children, that they would be a match for our children, that they'd be your match for them. You know, we, we miss that. We lose out on the faith. We lose out on the expectation that God could actually do this. What if it would be, uh, what if our, our, our godly, what if godly homes got on their knees and prayed that God would send the right people for their children instead of the first one to knock on the door and say, well, you go off with him and decide and come back and tell me. You know, it's, it usually ends up pretty bad. It usually ends up that there's some things that happen to your daughters that you wish had never happened usually winds up that your sons uh, end up doing things that you wish they had never done because you just send them off and hope that this one sticks. That's not how they did it here. And I'm, as again, we don't, we're not going to replicate every cultural um, situation, but we can replicate prayer. We can repl re replicate good character. We can look for godly people with, with the, that work hard and have good character before we just send off our kids to see if maybe this is the one. And you know, usually kids don't have good judgment. Now, maybe you don't agree with that, but teenagers have bad judgment. That's my opinion. And I think it wears out in our own lives. If you look backwards, you'll remember your teenage years. You didn't have that good a judgment. And generally, your parents have better judgment than you. And that doesn't mean we're going to pick any wives for our sons or any uh, daughters for our, I mean, uh, husbands for our, 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 our daughters. But what we are going to do is we're going to, have, we're going to have to help them. We're going to have to help them find someone. Rather than just send them off, to have in their in their 16 year old, 17 year old, 18 year old teenage judgment, just send them off and tell them, now come back when you found something. We need to get on our knees and help them find somebody. We need to get on our knees and pray them somebody. Pray it into their lives. Pray it in and pray them all the way to the marriage altar and guard them and protect them. Because if we just send them off in their in their youthful wisdom, which isn't very good, there's probably going to be way more bumps along the way. There's probably going to be way more trouble. And there's going to be some, some regrets. And wouldn't it be nice to be able to have a, your daughter at the altar wearing, her, um, wearing her, her wedding dress saying, Daddy, thank you. I have no regrets. Mom, thank you for, for being there. Your son at the altar saying, Mom, thank you. Thank you that you prayed for this one. She's like you are. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm going to be happy for the rest of my life. Because I, I waited on all the things I was supposed to wait on. I kept my heart. And I trusted your judgment. And I, I listened, you, your daughters listened to, to their dads, listened to their moms, and, and they trusted in them, and they leaned on them, and God used the whole family like that, leaning on the parents, trusting in them, and, and, and then God uses that. You see, in this passage of Scripture, you see God using Abraham, using Eliezer to bring about something beautiful. That's far better than what's going on. That's far better than what's going on. What, what goes on today is you have heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak, and then you have a wedding. And then you usually have a bunch of heartbreaks after that. And, in, and the wedding, uh, the, the marriages aren't staying together. It would be far better to have a situation where moms and dads are praying their children to the marriage altar and helping them all along the way. Amen. Being involved. Kids trusting their parents to help them know who to marry. Not telling them who to marry, but... Helping them through prayer and, and wisdom, that'd be a better way to do it. It'd be safer. 
And who can argue that a mom and a dad who love the Lord, who are on their knees and praying, can't help their kids find a husband or find a wife? That would be it's far better than a, like I said, than a 17-year-old, someone who's got no experience in life, going out and saying, now, there's a, there's a half, half the population is the opposite sex. Go pick one of them and come back and tell me, and then we'll pray over it. After you've already fallen in love, after you've already gone further than you should have gone, after you've already done some stuff, now we're going to see if this is the one. What if it's not? You have broken hearts and regrets and tears and it's trouble. Why not just pray? All right, let's go ahead and pray. We're done with our Sunday school lesson this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your wisdom. Lord, there's more in these passages of Scripture than we really want to, I mean, than we really can recognize right at the surface. But, Lord, I've read this passage so many times and not even thought that maybe we should do more of it. Not, not to just, it's not just an interesting story. It's not a romance. It's not a, a story that where someone finds love and, and we're just supposed to uh, then admire it from a distance. But we need to take as much of it as we can and we need to take as much of it as we can into our own culture and correct some of the mistakes we're making and use it, Lord. This isn't an isolated kind of event in the Bible. Parents helping the children find wives and, and husbands is, is all through the scriptures. It is even in the plan of God as you, Father, have chosen your people and the Son is going to have a wedding feast at the end of the people that you have drawn and you have, you have prepared. Lord, you are active in the wedding of the Lamb. And I thank you, God, for this picture. And I thank you for Abraham's life, his faith, and his dependence upon the Word of God and upon the person of Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name that you'll bless our next service. Amen.